All right. What's up, Wing Chun? How's it going? Hey, Losh. Glad you're here. What's up, Benjamin? Hey, Sal. Good evening. What's up, Bigfoot? How are you doing today? What's up, Psyduck? How are you doing? Hey, rude noise. Or are you to you? Bigfoot. Oh, he's starting the new job tomorrow. Hey. Hope it goes well, okay? What's up, Nikki? How are you doing? All right. Want to get started with some Wordle? Can we do it in one word today? Can we? Is that possible? Hey, what's up, sunny side? How are you doing? Must be cold in California, like 65 degrees. Yeah, yeah, I'm telling you. Terrible here. It's like 65, I'm freezing my ass off. All right. Window capture. Oh. There we go. Sounds like it could snow. Yeah, snow is coming any day now. Ugh. I'm dreading it. All right, let's do this. Do do do. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay, okay. How about Baroque Bronx? Bronx. Not a word. Brontosaurus. Bro. Broskis. Brock. Okay, okay. Hmm. Could be a crock or fra. Crow or fro. Or row, like wrote. Hmm, crook, crook. Okay. Krong, crof, krog, krog. Hmm. F, fro, or P, like prove. Oh, no, no E. No, pro, promo, pronto. Uh, wrote. Wrong. 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 It's probably wrong, but... Okay, okay, okay. Got another word. Mm. Front. No. Frond. Frond? That's a word, right? Frond. Yeah. My God. Not bad. <clears throat> Not bad. All right. Frond definition. Isn't it the the like some kind of plant on the water? Water surface kind of plant. There you go. A leaf or a leaf like part of a pro okay, not on the water. <laughs> That's a song. It's not a song. That does not count as karaoke. Give. How about frond? Leaf, take, gift. Oh, present. 
giving. Um, open. Holiday. Birthday. A gift. Mm, buy. Oh, purchase. Store. Um, haggle. Donate. <gasps> Donation. <gasps> Charity. <laughs> um. Uh, 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 what? What? What is it? Um, donation charity what is it money ah uh, um donation 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 Food? Nah. Tax? <laughs> Bestow? Donation? Hmm. Will? Hmm. Donation? Charity? Giving? Season of giving? Season? Tax? Um. Donor. How about a patron? Patronage. A supporter. Donator. 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 Supporter. A fan. A subscriber. <laughs> Support a <laughs> only fans endowment mm, supporter 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 a giver no aid hmm. Sponsor! Oh, that was a good one. Oh my god, you're so good. good job, Nikki. I was thinking, like, there's a there's a word. There's a word that's on the tip of my mind. All right, good job, guys. That was so fast. My god. My god. I guess we start early today. Nikki's on a row. Wait, which which row is she on? First row, second row. All right. Three weeks of it being under three minutes. Oh my god, are we gonna beat Samantha? Remember when I got it on the first try? Yeah, that was pretty good. That was a good day. All right. Oh, wait, we're supposed to do a recap. All right. What happened last week? So if you remember, last week, um, Bao Shi Ruo, she's the wife of Yang Tie Xin. Um, she's rescued from the Jin soldiered, soldiered, soldiers. Uh, she's rescued by a guy named Yan Lia. Okay, rescue, quote unquote. Um, uh, this guy was the guy that she saved from death a few months ago. Um, he says that her husband had died by the hands of the Jin soldiers. 
and he vows to avenge the husband. But first, they need to go north, okay, and lay low for a bit. Um, yeah, so that was what he said. Um, and she agrees to it. Not sure how much choice that she had. Um, Yan Lie, not Yang Lie. Same thing. Yang, Yang Lie. Um, so one day Yan Lai gets pickpocketed and has no money to pay the innkeeper. Um, the, the innkeeper, he demands money and he even sends uh, ruffians to rough him up uh, right in front of Bao Xi Ruo. Okay. And uh, Yan Lia, he, he, he just beats them up. Okay. Um, he turns out to be pretty powerful. The authorities come, but uh, Yan Lia, he just tells them to call the prefect of the city. Okay. And they do. And the prefect actually comes along with the district magistrate. Um, but instead of arresting this guy, the two dudes grovel at his feet, um, giving him like plenty of gifts and money. Turns out that Yan Lia was actually named Wan Yan Hong Lia. He's the sixth prince of the Jin dynasty. Okay? He sometimes likes to go south to mingle with the locals and to see how the commoners lived. Um, Bao Shiro hears this news and she's like, she's totally shook. Um, she, she shook, guys. She always considered the Jin her enemy. And then she goes into her room and then she cries into her pillow. Meanwhile, Wen Yan Hong Lia, he goes to explore the city. Okay? He goes out exploring the town and he sits inside a restaurant and he happens to see a meeting between some interesting people. Um, so the interesting people are these seven people named Seven Freaks of the South, okay, or the Seven Heroes of the South, depending on who is speaking. Um, and then there's this monk named Jiao Mu, this Buddhist monk, and then this Taoist priest named Chu Chu Chi. Okay, we've seen him before. He's the one who uh, Go Xiaotan and Yang Xin they met before, the guy who smashed the severed head. Um, the Taoist, he brings, he enters by bringing this big old cauldron filled with wine. Okay, it turns out he stole it from the monk's temple. Okay, it's a, it's a thing where you burn papers and stuff inside, okay? Um, in incense. He fills it with wine, uh, he fills it with wine, and he, he brings it up, and he accuses the monk of hiding two women in his Buddhist temple. Okay, the two women are Li Ping and Bao Shi Ro, the wives of the two heroes that he had made friends with. The monk denies it, but um, and uh, after some talk, they fight, of course, because that's what happens in these stories. And that's it. How's that? I do have a snack today. Hmm, <laughs> from Christmas. <laughs> it says, Merry Christmas. For my Christmas Tokyo treat box. Let's see. It looks like uh looks like it has a cake texture. Not sure how hard it is after uh it's been sitting there for a few months. What's <clears throat> up, Lady Koi? How you doing? Oh, Looks so appetizing. <laughs> See it? See it? Hmm. Cake. Okay, it's a little tough. <laughs> Not gonna lie. Hmm. Hmm. Well, it's not stale, so it's still good. It's kind of sugary. Sugary? I don't know what flavor it is. Just tastes like brown sugar. 
Brown sugar cake. Mm. Mm. It's kind of squishy. Squish rating is like three out of ten. Mm. Overall, it's like, a, I don't know. I'm going to say a six out of ten. You know, nothing to, nothing to cheer at, but nothing to scoff at either. And sugar, flour, eggs, and butter flavor. Yeah. <clears throat> What's up, Hope? I'm glad you made it. All right, you ready? Chapter two. And part in the middle. <laughs> yeah! All right, so let's see how this fight goes. All right. <clears throat> Mm, all right. So they're fighting with this big vat. They're like they're like pushing it back and forth in the air. Okay, they're like throwing it back and forth, um, using their palm moves or whatever. And Wang Yan, uh, Wang Yan Hong Lia was she secretly shocked, shocked I say, by what he had just witnessed. You bought a birthday cake, Hope. Oh my God. Is it anyone's birthday or you just bought a birthday cake? <clears throat> Choo Choo Chi caught the vat and took another gulp before shouting, A toast to Big Brother Ke! And the vat went flying towards Ke Jen -e. This is Ke, so Choo Choo Chi is the Taoist guy. Ke Jen -e is the leader of the seven freaks. A thought. Shot across Wan Yan Hong Lia's mind. This man is blind. How is he supposed to catch it? But it turned out that not only was Ke Jen -e's, Ke Jen -e the head of the seven freaks, his martial arts were also the best, and he could easily tell where the smallest of weapons were, were from the sound they made. <laughs> So this huge vat was no problem for him. He just calmly sat there as if he didn't notice anything until the vat was just about to hit his head. Only then did he suddenly raise his right arm and hit the bottom of the vat with his staff. The vat spun endlessly at the top of the staff, just like those plates at the end of an acrobat's stick. Suddenly, his iron staff moved a little off-center, and the vat began to lean as if it was going to fall onto his head. For some reason, the vat could not fall over as it stayed there, tilted. As the wine in the vat poured out of it, in a neat little steam stream, stream, Ku Jenu opened his mouth and the wine flowed neatly into it. Oh, he's drinking from the vat, guys. He's showing off. After taking three or four mouthfuls, his iron staff moved and was again in the middle of the vat bottom. He pushed his staff upwards, and the vat flew straight up. With a swing of the staff, he smacked the vat back towards Chu Chu Chi with a loud bang. The echoes could still be heard when Chu Chu Chi caught it again. Laughing, Chu Chu Chi commented, No, <laughs> Hiro Ku must like to spin plates in his spare time. Ku Jenu coldly answered, When I was little, I used to live off of the money I got from that little trick. Chu Chu Chi observed, Not forgetting where he comes from is the sign of a real man, fourth brother Nan, a toast. He took another gulp from the vat and threw it at him. Nan Shi Ren didn't say a word as he waited for the vat to arrive and then lifted his carrying stick to block. Dang! The vat was stopped cold in midair and began to fall. Nan Shiren 
cupped his hand, scooped up some wine from the vat, and downed it. While holding his carrying stick flat, he knelt down on his right knee with the middle of the carrying stick resting on its left. He pushed down on one end of the stick with his right hand and cut the bottom of the vat with the other end, flicking the vat up in the air once again. With the other hand. He was just about to hit the vat back to Chu Chu Chi when the hidden hero of the bustling city, Chang Chin Fa, laughed and said, Ha ha ha, I make a living selling stuff, so I like taking advantage. I might as well get a bit of wine without doing anything. He ran up to Nan, Nan Shi Ren's side and, when the vat fell back down again, scooped up a bit of wine and downed it. Suddenly he jumped up curled his legs so as the so that the bottom of both of his feet were on the vet, and as he pushed in mid-air, he caused his body to take a to take off like an arrow, and the vet to fly off in the opposite direction towards Chu Chu Chi. His body landed on the side of the wall and he lightly clambered down. The fan in magical hands scholar, Chu Tong, who is a scholar, hand did not stop flicking, and he could not Stop from commenting. Beautiful, beautiful. Chu Chu Chi caught the vet and took another big gulp before saying, Wonderful, wonderful. And now a toast to Brother Chu. Chu Tong shouted in desperation, I uh, don't do that. I'm not even strong enough to subdue a chicken. I can't hold my alcohol at all. I'll surely drink to death if I'm not squashed to death first. Before he finished, the vet was already heading his way. Chu Tong was shouting at the top of his lungs, Someone's going to be smashed to death! Help! Help! He made a scoop with his fan into the vet and brought it up to his mouth. Then he turned the fan around and hit the bottom of the vet with it and sent it flying off. Crack! The floorboards beneath him suddenly collapsed, forming a huge hole in the floor and he fell through it, all the while screaming, Help! Help! Everyone present knew that he was just playing around, so nobody was really surprised or worried. When Yan Honglie, however, seeing that he was able to flick away a huge vat with a small fan, and with a force that was no weaker than that which came from Nan Shiren's stick, he once again was shocked. The Yue sword maiden Han Xiaoying shouted, my turn for a drink. She hopped off with her right foot, and she took off like a bird. Just as she flew over the top of the vat, she lowered her head and took a gulp before nimbly and gently landing on the windowsill on the opposite side of the room. She was skilled at qinggong, which is lightness kung fu, and swordplay, but her strength wasn't up to par with the others. She figured that there was no way she would be able to catch this vat when it came flying towards her. Tossing it back towards Chu Chu Chi was even further out of the question, so she seized the opportunity and took her turn using her qinggong. Meanwhile, the vat was still flying out the window and into the street. With the street crowded as it was, it, was, it, would, be dis uh, it would be disastrous if the vat landed outside. Chu Chu Chi was a bit worried and was just about to jump out onto the street to catch it. He suddenly heard a whistle as a person in yellow ran past him. Another whistle, and the yellow horse that was downstairs ran out onto the street. To the people gathered around, it looked as if the huge ball of meat suddenly hit the vat and fell as one with it. The ball of meat and the vat both landed on the back of the yellow horse. Oh, this poor horse. He has to hold the vat and this big fat dude. The yellow horse ran forward a couple of jungs, so ten plus feet, before turning around and running back into the pavilion and up the stairs. The horse god Han Bao Zhu's body was actually underneath the belly of the horse, with his left foot in the stirrup and his right foot in both of his hands were holding the vat, balancing it neatly on the saddle. The horse was fast and steady, as if the stairs were flat ground to him. Han Baoju jumped back onto the horse, he put his head into the vat, and took a huge mouthful before pushing the vat off onto the floor of the room with his left hand. Letting out a hearty laugh, 
He cracked his whip, and the horse jumped out of the window, and, like a pegasus, gently landed in the middle of the street. Han Baoju jumped off his horse and walked back up the stairs along with Zhu Chong. Okay, so everyone's just showing off. Xiu Chu Qi complimented, The seven heroes of the South are really as good as the rumors say. I am speechless at the display of martial arts I have just seen. Giving the seven heroes face, I promise not to cause this monk any more trouble. If he hands over the two women and I... Wait, wait, what? Uh, I promise not to cause this monk any more trouble if he hands over the two women, and I will leave at once when he has. Kujana replied, Helder Chu, you are in the wrong here. The monk Jiao Mu has been meditating and has cleansed of worldly emotions for several decades now. He is a truly enlightened monk. He is someone that all of us have admired for a long time. The Fa Hua Monastery, which is the Temple of Oriental Zen, is also one of the famous sacred Buddhist landmarks here in the city of Jia Xing. How could any females, not to mention widows, possibly be hidden inside it? Chiu Chiu Chi replied, In this world there are always those people who are hypocrites, and I and do not deserve their reputations. Trying to control his anger, Han Bao Zhu shouted back, So was the elder saying that he doesn't believe us? Chiu Chiu Chi replied just as loudly, I much rather believe my very own eyes. Han Baoju replied, So, what is Elder Chiu planning to do now? Even though he was short, he, was, he still was quite intimidating and heroic in his own way because of his loud and clear voice. Chiu Chiu Chi replied, This matter originally had nothing to do with you seven, but since you are insisting on jumping into this matter, you are obviously quite confident of your abilities. Forgive me for daring to challenge the seven heroes. If I lose, then I'll do as everyone here wishes. Kujana replied, If the elder insists on going through with this, then would the reverend please choose how we would, how we should settle this matter? Chu Chu Chi thought for a moment and said, we never had any grudges previously, nor have we ever wronged each other. I have long admired the heroic name and reputation of the seven heroes of the South. I don't think any of us want to start fighting with swords or fists. So, how about this? He shouted, Innkeeper, bring fourteen big bowls. Ah, we're gonna have a drinking contest? This is a, the classic way of determining the, a fight. The innkeeper had been hiding on the floor below, but upon hearing his instructions and noticing that it had been quiet for a while upstairs, he immediately went to bring the bowls up. Chiu Chiu Chi instructed him to place the bowls in two rows and fill them to the brim with wine. Turning to the seven freaks, he said, I challenge everyone to a drinking contest. For every bowl you guys drink, I will drink one as well, until there is a winner. What do you say? Oh, he's challenging seven of them, guys. You can drink seven times they can. Han Baoju and Zhang Asheng were both huge drinkers, so they immediately agreed without any hesitation. Ku Jianhe frowned and replied, This is one against seven. Even if we win, we didn't win it fairly. Could Reverend please choose something else? Chiu Chiu Chi frowned. What makes you so sure that you'll beat me? Even though Han Xiaoying was a girl, she was still quite macho, oh, was she? So she immediately answered back. All right, let's go at it then. This is the first time I have met someone that dares to look down at us so much. As she talked, she grabbed a bowl of wine and downed it in one breath. It was obvious she drank it too quickly as her face flushed red immediately. Chiu Chiu Chi complimented, Miss Han really is a man among females. Everyone, please, 
The other six of the seven freaks each picked up a bowl and drank it. Chu Chu Chi responded by downing seven bowls of wine in an instant, each with just one gulp and without a single pause for breath in between. Can I butch up her voice a little? <laughs> okay, I'll try. The innkeeper immediately shouted praise for everyone and filled up the fourteen bowls, which the eight finished off immediately. By the third round of drinks, Han Xiaoying could drink half a bowl, could only drink half a bowl before having to pause because her hands were shaking. Zhang Asheng took the bowl out of her hand. Sister, I'll finish this for you. Han Xiaoying inquired, Elder Chiu, is that all right? Macho enough for you? Chu Chu Chi replied without hesitation, Of course, it doesn't matter who drinks it as long as it is seven bowls. Another round and Chang Qin Fa had to back out as well. Seeing that after 28 bowls, Chu Chu Chi was still looking sober and normal. The seven freaks were quite shocked. Wen Yan Hong Lia thought as he looked on, Wonderfully, this Taoist will get drunk and these seven freaks will finish him off before he can do anything. Chang Qin Fa Chen Qinfa calculated that his side still had five men left, each a heavy drinker, and could probably drink three or four more rounds. The opponent could not possibly be able to hold another twenty or so drinks in his belly. Or could he? Even if he really could not get drunk, his belly could only hold so much, unless he pees as he drinks. Didn't think of that, did you? Figuring that victory was in hand, he was feeling pretty good. Then he accidentally glanced down at the floor and saw that the floorboards under Chu Chu Chi's feet were obviously soaked through. Oh. <laughs> oh, he's using the um uh the Duan Yu method, isn't he? But he's just he's using his feet. He did not pee himself. I don't think so. Shocked, he whispered to Chu Tong, Second brother, take a look at his feet. Chu Tong only looked down for a moment before muttering, Not good, he's using his inner strength to force the wine out through his feet. Chang Qin Fa quietly replied, That's right, I didn't think that his inner strength would be so powerful. What should we do now? Chu Tong thought to himself, with this little trick, he could go a hundred more bowls without any problem. I have to come up with another contest or something. He took a step back before suddenly falling through the hole in the floorboards that he caused earlier, and then climbing back up through the hole, all the while shouting, So drunk! I am so drunk! Another round of drinks, and now the floorboards under Chu Chu Chi's feet were saturated with wine, and a little bit of a fountain squirted out from the boards onto the floor below. By now, Nian Xi Ren, Han Bao Ju, and everyone else had noticed, and everyone was secretly admiring such a powerful display of inner strength. Han Bao Ju put his bowl back onto the table and was just about to admit defeat when Zhu Tong shot him a look and turned to Chu Chu Chi. Elder's inner strength is almost godlike, and we can't but admire such a display. But it is still five against one. It doesn't seem quite fair, really. Chu Chu Chi was a bit surprised and asked, Then what does second brother Chu suggest we should do? Zhu Tong uh, smiled and said, I say, let the two of us battle. I say, let the two of us battle it out to see who's best. All the spectators were rather baffled by this. Zhu Tong was the one of the group of five still going up against him, who was obviously losing. Why would he go and lower his odds even more? But the other six freaks knew that although this brother of theirs doesn't seem to take anything seriously, he's full of ideas and tricks and his actions were often pure genius. Figuring that he must have a plan in mind, the six of them didn't object. All right, what's the plan? Q 
Chu Chu Chi let out a little laugh. No, oh, oh, oh. the seven freaks of the South really do want to look good no matter what. How about this? If second brother Chu finishes the wine left in this vat with me, if neither is losing, then uh, it'll count as a defeat for me. How about it? By now, the vat was a little bit less than half full, with many bowls remaining. This would mean that only two drunken Buddhas with their big bellies could hold all of it. But Chu Tong didn't seem to mind that as he smiled and said, Although I am not a very big drinker, I once beat several pretty big drinkers during one of my adventures. A toast, he said, waving his, uh, his fan with his right hand and his left shirt sleeve. He downed a bowl. So the two of them downed one bowl after another. In between drinks, Chu Chu Chi asked, What kind of big drinkers? Chu Tong replied, Well, once I traveled to India, and the king dragged out a water buffalo to challenge me in a drinking match. But in the end, neither of us won or lost. Knowing that Chu Tong was poking fun at him, he just snorted in response and downed another bowl. However, he noticed that even though Chu Tong was waving his hands all over the place while talking nonsense, he was still matching him bowl for bowl. There wasn't any wine spilling out from his hands or feet, so obviously he was not forcing the wine out of his body with inner strength. But there was a huge bulge in his stomach, so he figured that Chu Tong may know how to expand and retract his stomach at will. Oh, that's a good trick. He was feeling rather puzzled when Chu Tong spoke up again. The year before last, I went to Siam. Ha, now that's even more ridiculous. This time, the king of Siam got an elephant to challenge me. That huge thing drank seven vats. How much do you think I drank? Even though Chu Chu Chi knew he was just making stuff up, he could not help but ask, How much? Chu Tong's face suddenly turned dead serious as he lowered his voice and said, Nine vats. Suddenly he raised his voice again and shouted, Drink up, drink up. So he just went on like this, sort of drunk, but not really. Kind of crazy, but kind of not. And soon the two of them had finished off the entire vat. All right, have a good one, Sonny. The rest of the freaks had no idea that he could hold all of that wine, and all of them were pleasantly surprised. Chu Chu Chi gave him a thumbs up. Brother Chu is really amazing. With a smile, Zhu Tong replied, To keep the wine out of our bodies, Reverend use inner strength, but I had to resort to merely outer techniques. Here, have a look. With a hearty laugh, he suddenly did a backflip, and when he landed there... There was a, wait, when he landed, there was a wooden bucket in his hand. With a slight wave of his hand, the fragrances of the wine that filled half the bucket came pouring out. All of the people present were martial arts masters, and, with the exception of Ku Janu, were sharp enough to pick up on any trickery or fake moves. Yet, not a single one saw where the bucket came from. Looking down, Chu Tong's belly had suddenly returned to its normal flat shape. Obviously, the bucket was hidden underneath his robe. The seven freaks of the South all burst out laughing, and Chiu Chu Chi was shocked. Does that really count, guys? Wasn't the bet to actually drink the wine, not to pour it into a barrel or a bucket? As it turned out, Zhu Tong was best at trickery and illusions, and that was where the nickname Magical Hands Scholar came from. He's a magician. Well, he was peeing with his feet, well, but he actually did drink it. No? So, since he did drink it, that was, that was the deal. This little trick that he just pulled was passed down by a magician. Oh, all the way to today. A magician would walk onto the stage with nothing in hand. With one backflip, a goldfish bowl would be in his hand. Another backflip and a bowl filled with water appeared. This would go on and on until there were 
enough bowls on stage, and suddenly there was one goldfish in each bowl. This was absolutely astounding when witnessed firsthand, and had to be seen to be believed. The second time Chu Tong fell through the hole was when he hid the large bucket underneath his robe. All the crazy talk was to distract Chu Chu Chi. When a magician does his trick right, even hundreds upon hundreds of pairs of eyes could not spot how the trick was done. Chu Chu Chi did not even suspect that he would be pulling this kind of trick, and was not able to catch him pouring one bowl after another into the bucket underneath his robe. Chu Chu Chi snorted. <laughs> you call this drinking? Chu Tong laughed. And what you did was. The wine I drank is in this bucket. The wine that you drank is on the floor. Any differences there? He paced back and forth as he talked. Suddenly, he accidentally slipped on the puddle of wine by Chu Chu Chi's feet and fell towards Chu Chu Chi. Chu Chu Chi caught him and let Chu Tong balance himself. After pacing back and forth once more, he suddenly said in a loud voice, a Wonderful poem, such wonderful poetry. Mid-autumn have always, moon most bright, cool winds lead the way for refreshing night. A day's fortunes sinks man in silver, the dragons in four seas leap out water. His voice was slowly dragging out as he began to sing the lines. Shocked, Chu Chu Chi thought to himself, That's the poem that I started, but didn't finish last mid-autumn. I always have it by my side in case I ever think of the next four lines. Nobody else has seen it. How does he know it? Oh, he pickpocketed it. Reaching into his shirt, he found that the scroll had, that contained the poem was missing. With a smile, Zhu Tong unrolled the scroll and laid it out on the table. Not only are Elder Chu's martial arts among the best in the world, his poetry and style is as well. Amazing, truly amazing. He had slipped and fallen on purpose, enabling him to use those magical pickpocket skills of his to steal the scroll from Chu Chu Chi. Chu Chu Chi thought to himself, I didn't notice it at all when he reached into my shirt and, take, and took out the scroll. If he didn't intend to take my poem, but was instead trying to stab me, would I still be alive now? Obviously, he had my life in his hands and let me live. Now that he thought about that, the anger in him subsided, and he said, Since Hiro Chu has finished his entire vat of wine with me, I will do as promised and admit defeat. In this little match today, in the pavilion of the drunken immortal, Chu Chu Chi lost to the seven heroes of the South. Amid smiles, the seven freaks of the South replied, No, no, that's okay. This kind of game can't be taken seriously. Chu Tong added, Besides, Reverend Chu's inner strength is miles above all of us. Chu Chu Chi continued, Although I have admitted defeat, those two widows have to be rescued. He saluted with his hands and lifted the vet. I'm heading off to the Fahua Monastery to get them. An angry Ku demanded, You have admitted defeat. Why are you still troubling Monk Jiao Mu? Chiu Chiu Chi replied, Lives are at stake. It has nothing to do with winning or losing. Honored hero Ku, if your friend met an unfortunate end, and his widow was suffering at the hands of others, would you do all you could to save them? Suddenly his expression changed, and he shouted, Oh, I see how it is. You had more people coming. Even if you get the entire Jin army here, I'm still going to see this to the very end, even if it means giving up my life. Chang Ah Sheng replied, There's just a seven of us, no need for more people. But Ku Jena had heard several dozen men running in this direction, as well as the clanking of their weapons, so he immediately stood up and commanded, Everyone, back off! Chang Ah Sheng and all the others hid their weapons since all of them had heard the footsteps by now. 
Before long, several dozen men came running up the stairs. These men were Jin soldiers. Uh oh. Chu Chu Chi respected the seven freaks of the South and figured that they were being kept in the dark by the lies of the monk Jiao Mu. He was careful of what he said so as not to offend them too much. But suddenly, seeing dozens of Jin soldiers so showing up, he could not control his anger, and he shouted, Monk Jiao Mu! Seven freaks! How dare you people actually befriend someone, then ask the Jin for help against them? How can you still call yourself righteous men of the martial world? Han Baoju shouted back, Poof! Asking the Jin for help! These soldiers were actually the personal guards of Wen Yan Hong Lie. They followed him into town and began, became unsettled because Wen Yan Hong Lie had been out of sight a long time. Upon hearing that there was fighting in the pavilion of the drunken immortal, and fearing the worst, they came running. Chu Chu Chi snorted. Hmm, all right, all right. Please forgive me for not staying any longer. This matter between us is not over yet. He picked up his vet and went home, and started to walk towards the stairs. Kujana stood back up. Reverend Chu, there's some misunderstanding here. Still walking, Chu Chu Chi re replied, Misunderstanding? You people are supposedly righteous heroes. Why ask Jin soldiers to help you in a fight? Ku Jana replied, But we didn't. Chu Chu Chi rebuked. I can see what's going on in front of me. I'm not blind. What Ku Jana hated the most was the fact that he was blind and, any, and anything that reminded him of it. He slammed his iron staff onto the floor and demanded, And what if I am blind? Chu Chu Chi didn't answer as he lifted up his left hand and struck a Jin soldier on his forehead with his palm. <laughs> Just casually doing that. The soldier did not even have a chance to mutter a sound before his head split open. Chu Chu Chi shouted back, He is a good example. Flipping his sleeves in the Seven Freaks' general direction, he walked down the stairs. All right. All right, guys. I'll take a five-minute break. I'll be right back. All right, we're back. How are you guys doing? All right, so they just killed the dude. Seeing one of their own die, the Jin soldiers' actions immediately became chaotic as several of them charged at Chu Chu Chi with lances pointed at his back. He did not even turn around, and as if there were eyes on the back of his head, he knocked each of the lances down one by one. The rest of the soldiers were just about to charge up from below as well when Wen Yan Honglia ordered them to stop. Ooh. Is he revealing himself? Turning to Ku Jenu, he said, Turning to Ku Jenu, he said, This Taoist bastard is intolerable. Why don't all of us sit down and have a nice drink while we discuss how to take care of him? When he ordered the Jin soldiers to stop, Ku Jenu had figured out that he was the leader of the soldiers, so he shouted back, Damn it! Get out of my face! Wen Yan Hong Lia hadn't even recovered from this shock when Han Baoju added, My big brother told you to get out of his face! He bumped Wen Yan Hong Lia on his waist with his right shoulder. Wen Yan Hong Lia stumbled back several steps as the seven freaks and the monk Jiao Mu quickly filed out. Zhu Tong was trailing behind them. As he walked by Wen Yan Hong Lia, remember he stole this guy's money? He gently tapped him on the shoulder with his fan and asked with a smile, Have you sold off that girl? How about selling her to me? <laughs> As he hurried down the steps, he was still laughing. Although Zhu Tong did not know anything about Wen Yan Hong Lia, he could tell from the way that he was treating Bao Xi Ru that they were not a couple. 
Then he overheard him bragging about his wealth, so he had to take a bit of his money just to cause a little trouble. But now that he found out he's a leader of Jin soldiers, how could he not take more of his money? <laughs> Lol. When Yan Honglia reached into his shirt and, as expected, all the money that was in his shirt had inexplicably disappeared. Not only was he worried about the fact that all these men were such great martial arts masters, but if they somehow found out that he had Madame Bao with him, what a disaster that would be. Luckily, since Chiu Chiu Chi and the Seven Freaks still hadn't worked out their misunderstanding, this was the perfect time for him to get out of town. He immediately went back to the inn and headed north with Bao Xi Ruo that very night. They traveled until they arrived back at the capital of the Jin Empire, Yanjing, which is modern-day Beijing. As it turned out, after that night in which Chiu Chiu Chi killed Wang, Wang Dao Qian and met the two men, he killed, wait, then killed another group of Jin soldiers, he arrived in Hangzhou in great spirits. He spent several days in a row by the lake, the Gu Peak at the north end of the West Lake. Besides being a famous Taoist retreat, it was the place where Gu Hong concocted his medical pills at that time. Chu Chu Chi spent his mornings enjoying the land and the people, and his afternoons inside the Taoist temple on top of Gu Peak, making medicine and practicing martial arts. One day, he was walking on a pier on the shore of the Qing River when he suddenly saw a group of ten or so government soldiers walking by in a very sorry state, with their armor falling apart and their weapons broken. Obviously, they had just lost a battle. He was rather puzzled. We aren't at war with the Jin nowadays, and I haven't heard anything about any ruffians and uprisings around here. Where in the world did they lose this battle? He asked around, but nobody knew about it either. His curiosity peaked. He followed the soldiers back to their camp at command post 6. He waited until after midnight before he snuck into the camp and dragged the soldier out into a small alley to interrogate him. That soldier was in the middle of a dream when suddenly, out of nowhere, a sharp blade was put up against his throat. In shock and fear, he did not hide a thing, and he spilled all the secrets about going into Ox Village to capture two men and everything else that happened that night. Chu Chu Chi could not believe it when that soldier told him that Guo Xiaotian had died that night, and Yang Tie Xin, gravely wounded, was missing and most likely dead as well. The soldier kept on saying that the two widows had been captured, but on their way back, out of nowhere, they had run into another group of soldiers, and for some weird and stupid reason, they fought and lost. Chu Chu Chi was about to lose his temper when he realized that this man was merely a soldier who was following orders, and not truly responsible for what happened. So he demanded, Who's your superior? The soldier answered, the, the commander's surname is Tuan, given name Tian De. Chiu Chu Chi let him go and snuck back, trying to find Duan Tian De, but to no avail. The next morning, a pole was erected in front of the commander's house. A head was dangling on top of it, as a warning to other criminals. Chiu Chu Chi only took one look and recognized that it belonged to Guo Xiao Tan. Oh, damn. In, in sadness and anger, he thought, Choo choo chi, choo choo chi, this man is a descendant of a patriot. Out of kindness, he asked you to have a drink with him, yet you brought upon him such calamities. If you do not find justice for him, how can you go on pretending to be a man? After forcing himself to wait until nightfall, he climbed up the pole and took down Guo Xiaotan's head. He dug a hole on the shore of the West Lake and buried the head there. After several kowtows, he wiped the tears away from his face as he silently swore, I promise to teach, 
I promise to teach the two heroes his children martial arts. I have kept every promise I have ever made. And if I cannot turn your children into heroes among men, then let me never see my brothers in the afterlife. I will no longer deserve such an honor. He calculated that the first thing he needed to do was to find that Duan Tian De and get revenge for his two dead sworn brothers. After that, he would rescue the two widows and take them to some place safe so that the two kids could be born and leave a legacy for those two heroes. For two straight nights, he searched through Command Post 6, but was not able to find Duan Tian Du at all. He became worried that this man, because of greed and corruption, did not follow military regulations and might not spend time with the soldiers under him at all. On the third night, he stepped out in front of the command post and shouted, Duan Tian De, come out here this instant! Because of the fact that Guo Xiao Tian's head had been taken, Duan Tian De was inside interrogating Li Ping about any other criminal masterminds that her husband might know, when suddenly there was a chaos outside. Okay, so he got Li Ping. He stuck his head out of a window and saw a big, tall Taoist with incredible ferocity and style, grabbing a soldier with each hand and tossing them out of the way as he made his way through the crowd of soldiers. One of the commanders repeatedly shouted, Let loose the arrows! Let loose! In the chaos, some of the soldiers grabbed a bow but couldn't find any arrows, while other soldiers gathered some arrows but did not grab a bow. Furious, Duan Tian De pulled out his saber and charged forward, screaming, Want to rebel? He swung at Chu Chu Chi's waist. Seeing that he was an officer, Chu Chu Chi did not budge at all. Instead, he tossed aside the soldier that was in his hands and, with one simple motion of his left hand, grabbed Duan Tian De's wrist and demanded, Where is that bastard, Duan Tian De? Writhing in pain, Duan Tian De immediately replied, Is the reverend looking for Mr. Duan? He, uh, he's drinking by the West Lake. I don't know if he's going to make it back today. Believing him, oh no, Chu Chu Chi let him go. Duan Tian De turned to two soldiers by his side and ordered, Take the reverend to the lake shore so that he can find the commander. The two soldiers didn't catch on, so he shouted, What are you standing there for? Hurry! The reverend will get mad! The two men finally caught on and began walking. Chu Chu Chi followed them off. I don't know, he runs away. Not daring to stay a moment longer, Duan Tian De took several guards and Li Ping and headed straight towards the 8th command post. The commander was drinking, wait, was his drinking pal, and, upon hearing what had happened, immediately offered to dispatch some help for him to catch this Taoist bastard. He was just about to dispatch his troops when his camp suddenly broke out in chaos as one of the soldiers ran in and reported that a Taoist had come charging into camp. Turned out the soldiers that were with him couldn't take the pressure and told him about the places that Duan Tian De frequently went to. Oh no. Being the alert man that he was, Duan Tian De did not hesitate and he grabbed Li Ping and ran. He ran to the se second command post outside of the city, figuring that he could lose Chu Chu Chi because of its, its remote location. After he settled down, the images of that Taoist rampaging through the army haunted him. By this time, his wrist began to hurt and swell again. He went to an army doctor in the camp, and it turned out that two bones in his wrist had actually snapped. Two bones? Wouldn't that hurt immediately? He just noticed it now? Was he just too scared? Too frightened to go home, he decided to stay in the second command post for the night. He slept till midnight when a disturbance outside woke him up. 
and apparently one of the soldiers studying guard had disappeared. Duan Tiandu jumped out of his bed, somehow knowing that the guard must have been kidnapped by that Taoist, deciding that no matter where he hide, where he hid in the army camps, the Taoist would eventually find him. He had to find something else to do. This Taoist had already met him and was only coming for him and him alone. Even though there were lots of soldiers in the army, he was probably not going to come out unscratched. He was about to break down in a panic when he suddenly remembered that his uncle, whose martial arts were quite good, had retreated to the Yun Lo Temple to become a monk. Why not hide there? Figuring that this Taoist's attacks probably had something to do with Guo Xiaotian, he ordered Li Ping be changed into a soldier's uniform, and then dragged her to the Yun Lo Temple with him in the middle of the night. He thought that if he really got into trouble, he could use her as leverage against the monk. Okay, so it's these two, then. So it's Li Ping and this motherfucker. It's not Li Ping and, um, and, what's his face? Yang Tieshin. His uncle, given the Buddhist name of Ku Mu, became a monk a long time ago and had become the abbot of the Yunlo temple. Before that, he had... <clears throat> or is this a different temple? Before that, he had been an army officer, and his martial arts training came as a disciple of the Xianxia sect that was prevalent in the provinces of Jiuqiang and Jiangsu and could be considered a branch of the Shao of Shaolin martial arts. He had never approved of Duan Tiandu's character, and kept a distance between them. Seeing him stumbling into the monastery in such a sorry state in the middle of the night, he was quite annoyed and asked coldly, What are you doing here? Knowing that his uncle hated the jinn to the bone, Duan Tiandu knew that if he told the truth, his uncle might kill him on the spot himself. So, on the way here, he had already thought of a lie. Seeing his uncle's cold stare at this moment, he immediately knelt down and kowtowed. Someone is troubling me. Please, help me, uncle. Buddhist monk Kumu replied, You are an army officer. It's a miracle if you don't go troubling others. Who would dare to trouble you? With an innocent look on his face, Duan Tiandu replied, I'm no good, but I'm hiding here and there from this Taoist bastard. I hope that uncle will, for the sake of late father, save me. Out of pity, the monk Ku Mu asked him, Why is the Taoist chasing you? Duan Tiandu knew that the more repentant he sounded, the better off he was. So he said, It's all my fault. My fault. Two days ago, I went to the Wazi on the west side of Clear Coolness Bridge. The abbot Kumu snorted and his face dropped. Washu or Wazi was the Washu or Wazi was the slang word for brothels back at the time. From that came the saying, Waz gather when time comes, Waz scatter when time goes which was used to describe something that comes easily and goes just as fast. Duan Tiandu continued, There was someone there that I had met on many occasions, and she was in the middle of a song when a Taoist suddenly burst in and said that she had to entertain him because her song was so good. Abbot Kumu abruptly cut in, Bull! What is a priest doing in a place like that? Duan Tiandu replied, That's what I said, and then I told him to leave. But it turned out that Taoist was a low life and cursed me for enjoying myself, in spite of the fact that I would lose my head in the next couple of days. Abbot Kumu asked, What is he talking about? Duan Tiandu replied, He said that the Jin army was going to cross the river and invade south soon and was going to kill every single one of us Song soldiers.
Furious, Buddhist abbot Kumu demanded, Did he really say that? Duan Tiandu nodded. Yes, I guess my temper was not really good either, and I got into an argument with him, saying that if the jinn really did invade it, we would at least all die fighting and wouldn't necessarily lose. This really rubbed the abbot Kumu the right way, so much so that he could not help but nod in approval, as he thought this was the best thing that this nephew of his ever said. Seeing him nod, Duan Tiandu's hope lit up, and he continued, We just kept on arguing until we began to fight, but I wasn't a match for the Taoist. He came chasing after me. I had nowhere else to go, so that's why I came here. Uncle, please, help me. The monk Kumu replied, I am a monk. I am not getting involved in this kind of name-seeking matters that you men get yourself into. Duan Tiandu begged, just, uh, just one time, uncle. I will never do anything like this again. Remembering his brother of yesteryear and quite angry at the Taoist for saying what he said, the venerable Kumu finally relented. All right, you can hide here for a couple of days. I don't want any kind of trouble from you. Duan Tiandu agreed to everything and anything he demanded. Abbot Kumu sighed. Hey, an honorable army officer. Pah, utterly useless. If the Jin army really does invade, then what will we do? I, back then, I... Frightened by threats from Duan Tiandu, Li Ping just stood there by his side through all his lies, not daring to say a single word. The next afternoon, the guest attending monk, Ju Ku Sheng, ran in and reported to monk Ku Mu. There's a Taoist priest out front, shouting all kinds of stuff and creating havoc, saying something about making Duan, Commander Duan come outside. Abbot Kumu went and got Duan Tiandu and told him. In a panic, Duan Tiandu said, It's him! It's him! Abbot Kumu asked, Which sect does this vicious Taoist belong to? Duan Tiandu replied, I don't know which hole that barbarian crawled out of, but his martial arts don't seem that great. It's just that his arm strength is enormous. The only reason I lost is because I didn't know any martial arts at all. Abbot Kumu replied, All right, I'm going to meet him in person. Walking out to the main hall, he ran right into Chu Chu Chi, who was trying to break into the temple. The guard monks were trying their best to slow him down, but they were failing. The abbot Kumu walked up to him and gently pushed Chu Chu Chi's shoulder, using a bit of inner strength. He figured he would just push Chu Chu Chi out of the main hall, but to his surprise, it felt as if he was pushing down on a pile of cotton. There was nothing there that he could actually push against. Knowing that he was in trouble, he immediately tried to pull back, but it was too late, as he stumbled back out of control and backed into the offerings table. Crack! Boom! Half of the offerings table collapsed, and all of the offerings on it were scattered and fell onto the floor. Shocked, a thought ran through his mind. This Taoist's martial arts are truly amazing, much more than just enormous arm strength, undoubtedly. He immediately held his palm up and saluted. May I ask why the reverend has come to visit our humble monastery? Chu Chu Chi replied, I'm looking for an evil criminal with the surname of Duan. Knowing that he himself was no match for Chu Chu Chi, Kumu replied, We men of religion should always be merciful and forgiving. Why is the priest stooping to the same level as a layman? Ignoring him, Chu Chu Chi walked into the inner hall 
By now, Duan Tiandu had already hidden himself in Li Ping. Yun Lo Temples' incense was very popular, and it was the spring pilgrimage season, so the hall was filled with believers of both genders. Realizing that it was impossible to search thoroughly, Xiu Chu Ji not uh, snorted and walked out. When Duan Tiandu came out from his hiding place, Monk Kumu demanded angrily, Barbarian? If he wasn't holding back, I would be dead by now. Duan Tiandu replied, That barbaric Taoist is a spy for the Jin. Why else would he make a point of specifically troubling us officers of Great Song? The Ji Ku Sung came back in and reported that the Taoist had left. Monk Kumu asked, Did he say anything as he left? The Ji uh, Ku Sung replied, he said that he would never give up until we turn over that, uh, that officer named Duan. The Kumu shot an angry look at Duan Tiandu and said, Judging from what you said, I can't figure out why you are hiding. This Taoist's martial arts are really too strong. You probably won't come out alive if you fall into his hands. After quietly thinking for a while, he continued, You can't stay here any longer. My younger martial brother Monk Jiao Mu's martial arts are better than mine. He's the only one who has a chance of stopping that Taoist. Why don't you go and hide with him for a while? Ah, there we go. Duan Tiandu didn't even dare to utter a single word, fearing that he might anger his uncle. Later, his uncle handed him a letter to give to the monk Jiao Mu explaining the situation. He immediately rented a boat and headed for Jia Xing in the middle of the night. How could the monk Jiao Mu have guessed that the person he dragged in with him was actually a woman? Since well, was actually a woman. Since he had the, the letter from his elder martial brother, he naturally allowed Duan Tiandu to stay. When Chiu Chu Ji found about, out about this, he came pursuing as well. He even spotted Li Ping in the back gardens of the temple. But by the time he'd burst into the temple, Duan Tiandu had already dragged her into the underground storage room with him. Chu Chu Ji, still thinking that Li Ping was in the temple, demanded that she be handed over. Since he saw her with his own eyes, he did not believe any answers that the monk Jiao Mu came up with, and their argument got worse and worse. As soon as Chiu Chiu Ji revealed a bit of his martial arts, the monk Jiao Mu knew absolutely that he was no match. Having always been a good friend of the Seven Freaks, he set up a meeting with Chiu Chiu Ji in the pavilion of the Drunken Immortal. That huge vat that Chiu Chiu Ji had with him came from that very Fa Hua monastery. When he ran into the Jin soldiers in the pavilion of the Drunken Immortal, Chiu Chiu Ji's misunderstanding got even worse. The monk Jiao Mu really did not know much about the truth of the matter. On the way back to the Fa Hua Monastery from the Pavilion of the Drunken Immortal, he told the seven freaks about the two men that his martial brother Abbot Kumu sent to him. He added at the end, I have heard... I have heard that all of the seven masters of the Chanjun sect are masters of martial arts, each receiving the direct teachings of Master Chong Yang. Among them, Elder Chan Chun Zi was known as the best. It turns out that he's as good as they say. Even though he's rather rude, he doesn't seem to be the kind of the kind who doesn't care for a reason, and there aren't any enmities between the two of us. There must be some great misunderstanding at work here. Chang Jinfa suggested, I think the best thing to do is to bring out the two men that your martial brother sent to you, so we can sort it out. No. Uh -oh. Monk Jiaomu acknowledged, Good point. I haven't really interrogated them very well yet. He was just about to send some people to go get Duan Tiandu, when Ku Jianu spoke up. That priest Chiu Chiu Ji's temper is really something quite explosive. He obviously 
does not consider us people in the martial world south of the Jiangzi as worthy of respect. His Chanjin sect may be able to act like bosses up north, but we can't allow them to act like bosses when they come down south like this. If we can't clear up the misunderstanding, then we have to sort this out with martial arts. If we go up against him one on one, none of us are a match for him. But he didn't come here with good intentions. Zhu Tong added. Let's gang up on him, together. Han Baoju commented. Eight against one? Not very heroic, don't you think? Chan Jinfa reasoned. It's not like we are going to kill him. We are only trying to calm him down so he will listen to the monk Jiao Mu's explanation. Han Xiaoying was rather worried. If it gets out that Monk Jiao Mu and the Seven Freaks of the South ganged up on someone, wouldn't that tarnish our name? The eight of them hadn't worked out what to do yet when a thunderous noise came from the main hall of the temple, followed by the thundering of metal banging on metal. Chiu Chuji was banging the huge bell that hung from the ceiling of the main hall with a bronze vat. After several hits, the vat began to crack. The look on his face was furious. The seven freaks didn't know that Chiu Chu Ji wasn't always this rash and unreasonable. He had been so frustrated by his own inability to capture Duan Tian Du that he was about to lose control. That, added to his deep-seated hatred of the Jin, led to his behaving this way. <clears throat> the seven freaks all thought that he was trying to bully them with his reputation so they decided to fight it out. The more famous the seven masters of Chan Jun were, the more determined the seven freaks were not to back down, and appeared to be bullied. If Chu Chu Ji had been some unknown martial arts practitioner, this situation would have, ironically, been much easier to resolve, and probably already would have been. Han Bao Ju shouted, Sister, must take the lead. He was Han Ya Xiaoying's first cousin on her father's side, and of the seven, had the least amount of patience. In one motion, the golden dragon whip that was around his waist was now in his hands, and he swept a wind swirling the crippled cloud, causing the whip to snap toward Chiu Chu Ji's right hand, which was holding up the vat. Han Xiaoying unsheathed her sword as well as and thrust toward the center of Chiu Chu Ji's back. Attacked from both fronts, Chiu Chu Ji rotated his wrist, causing the whip to hit the vat instead. When he, when he turned his body slightly sideways and let the sword pass by his side. In the last years of the spring and autumn era, the states Yue and Wu were mortal enemies. The king of the state of Yue, Gu Qian, in order to remind himself of the shame of defeat and to motivate himself to excel, tortured himself by sleeping on a straw bed and tasting every day a gallbladder, a gallbladder that he hung from the ceiling. Nevertheless, the king of Wu had a general under him named Wu Zhu Xu, who, being a disciple of Sun Tzu's school of war, was a great tactician and trainer. Seeing that his army was still no match for his enemies, Guo Qian got more and more depressed. One day, a beautiful young girl with amazing sword skills suddenly appeared inside the Yue borders. Happy beyond words, Guo Qian immediately asked her to teach his soldiers her skills and was finally able to, de to defeat the Wu army because of it. Jiaxing, being the meeting place between the two states, was a place where several battles occurred. There was no surprise that the entire sword technique was passed down in this area. The only problem was that the sword skill was designed to be most effective on the battlefield. It was mostly used to chop down numerous soldiers and bring down horses in a crowd. It was not nimble or agile enough when used against martial arts practitioners in the martial world. It was only in the last days of the Tang Dynasty that this sword technique received a much-needed upgrade from a swordplay genius from this area. The sword, this sword master made the moves much more complex and speedier, 
Although Han Xiaoying hadn't yet mastered the entire repertoire that she learned from her master, she was still very deadly. Her nickname, Yue Sword Maiden, was a reference to this. <clears throat> so the, the, there's a whole story about the Sword of the Yue Maiden by Jin Yong. After only a few moves, Chiu Chiu Chi had figured out her repertoire and decided to beat its speed with even more speed. She was fast. Chiu Chiu Chi was even faster. Using his right arm to block Han Bao Ju's whip, his left hand came, out, came shooting out in an attempt to snatch the sword out of her hand by sheer force. In an instant, Han Xiaoying was forced to retreat to the side of the temple statue of Buddha. Nian Xi Ren and Zhang Asheng charged in and attacked from both sides. Nian Xi Ren was just as quiet as can be and let his carrying stick make all the sounds. But Zhang Asheng was completely opposite, shouting and screaming all kinds of street talk and all in his southern Yangtze accent. Chiu Chiu Ji didn't understand any of it, so he just pretended he didn't hear it. In the flurry of the fight, Chiu Chiu Ji's left palm suddenly came straight out right at Jiang Asheng's face. Instinctively, Jiang Asheng bent himself over backwards to avoid it, but the move turned out to be a decoy. Chiu Chiu Ji's right foot came flying out, hitting Jiang Asheng's right wrist, knocking his knife loose. But Jiang Asheng was much better with nothing in his hands, so he did not miss a beat as he balanced himself with his left leg, faked with the right hand, and attacked with his left fist. Chiu Chiu Ji let out a shout of approval before dodging out of the way and uttering, Pity, pity, Zhang Asheng had to ask, What? Chiu Chiu Ji replied, Pity that you, such a martial arts expert, would bring shame upon yourself by befriending evil monks and serving the jinn. Made furious by that accusation, Zhang Asheng shouted back, Bastard Taoist, you are the one that's serving the jinn. He took three swings at Chiu Chiu Ji in quick succession during that exchange. Chiu Chiu Ji dodged out of the way and tilted the vat, causing two of Jiang Asheng's punches to actually land on the vat. Seeing that they were still losing despite their four to one advantage, Chiu Tong made a gesture towards Chang Jin Fa, and the two of them charged into the scuffle. Chan Jinfa's weapon was a huge hand scale, with which he used the scale handle as a bat. A hand scale? Can we look that up? Chinese hand scale. Like this? Oh, just this? So he just use the scale handle as a bat. The scale hook as a flying hook. The scale weight as a mace. Okay, I like this. I like this. <clears throat> no, okay. Literally th three weapons in one. Zhu Tong, on the other hand, excelled at hitting pressure points. That dirty and broken fan of his was actually made of iron, which he used like an extension of his arm. This facilitated hitting pressure points and deflecting other weapons or enemies coming at him. Chiu Chiu Ji spun and tilted the vat in his right hand at will, making it a huge shield that guarded his front side while using his left hand to fight back and attack. With such a huge burden in his hand, he could no longer move up around as nimbly as he should, but it was still quite advantageous for him, because he could use the vat to block many of the attacks coming towards him. The monk Jiaomu, seeing the fight quickly get out of hand, figured that someone could be seriously hurt at any moment now, 
He tried to get everyone's attention by shouting as loud as he could. Everyone, please stop. Please listen to what I have to say. But who would actually stop in the middle of a fierce fight? Chu Chu Ji shouted back. Hypocrite! Who wants to hear you talk? Watch this. Suddenly, his left hand turned ferociously towards Jiang Asheng as it shifted between fist and palm over and over again, without rhyme or reason. This move, called Flying Mountain Outside the Heavens, was based on strange form and incredible speed, and was meant to take an opponent by surprise, as it did Jiang Asheng. Monk Jiao Mu shouted, No! Reverend, please don't! Chu Chu Chi had been fighting for so long and against so many able opponents that he was afraid that the fight would last too long. Since there were two men standing on the sidelines waiting to jump in at any moment, he was worried very much about his own life. Now that he had found an opening in his opponent's defense, how could he just let it go? Therefore, he put all of his strength and power behind this move. In his martial arts training, he trained his body specifically to strengthen the toughness of his skin. The fact that he liked to wrestle with wild bulls and buffaloes for work as a hobby, and as a hobby, Jiang Asheng's body was covered with a layer of thick and hard muscles, which resembled the thick skin of bulls. Even though he knew that this strike packed quite a force, and since he figured that he couldn't get out of the way, he immediately gathered his inner strength and prepared himself for a strike on his shoulder and shouted, Come on! Hence, he caught the palm full on. Crack! Incredibly, his collarbone, despite all of his preparation, snapped under the pure inner force of the Chanjun sect. Shocked, Zhu Tong attacked aggressively with his iron fan, aiming right at a pressure point on Chu Chu Ji. As the saying goes, offense is the best defense. Zhu Tong attacked to protect his sworn brother from further harm now that he was injured. But Xiu Chu Ji, having just gained the upper hand, immediately began to seize some of the weapons that were flying around him. Aya! Chan Jinfa shouted as Xiu Chu Ji got a hold of his scale. With a jerk, Xiu Chu Ji pulled him a meter closer. This put him between Chu and the other two attackers. Nian Xi Ren and Zhu Tong. Wait, other two, the other attackers, Nan Xi Ren and Zhu Tong. Chu Chu Ji's left palm flew toward Chan Jin Fa's scalp. Han Bao Ju and Han Xiao Ying both immediately jumped in and thrust their weapons at Chu Chu Ji's head in an attempt to stop him. Chu Chu Ji had no choice but to, but to dodge out of the way and let Chan Jin Fa escape. Having just escaped death, Chan Jin Fa was covered in sweat. Nevertheless, he took a kick to his side that made him writhe on the ground in pain, unable to get up. The monk Jiao Mu didn't want to actually come to blows. He had hoped that this misunderstanding with Chu Chu Ji would have been peacefully worked out by now. Seeing the friends that had come to his aid were going down one by one, he had to join in the scuffle. He tossed his long sleeve raised the piece of burnt wood in his hand, and lunged at Chu Chu Ji. Chu Chu Ji thought, So, it seems that this monk is a master at hitting pressure points. He put up his guard against him. Ku Jana figured from all of the shouting that his sworn brothers and sister were hurt, so he grabbed his iron staff and was about to charge into the fight when Chan Jin Fa shouted, Big brother! Fire your projectiles, first at Jin, then go for Xiao Guo. Before his voice even died down, two projectiles flew directly toward Chu Chu Ji's forehead and right hip. Chu Chu Ji was shocked. It's not often that one meets a blind man able to fire projectiles so accurately, even with the person on the side telling him where to fire them. He immediately spun the vat in his hand and knocked the two projectiles down. These projectiles were used only by Ku Jianu, and had corners on all four sides like a diamond, but as sharp as anyone could make them. He learned to use them after he was blinded because the projectiles were heavy, making it easy for him to be accurate. After knocking the projectiles down with the vat, Chu Chu Ji actually felt the vat shake. He thought, Amazing, what strength! 
By now, all of the other freaks had dodged out of the way. Chan Jinfa still kept shouting, Zhang Fu, now Lie. Good, now the Taoist was moved into Mingyi. He had done he had done this with Ke Jianne so many times over the years that it almost seemed as if his eyes were Ke Jianne's. He was the only one among freaks that could do this. Ke Jianne was firing as if he could see and in an in the Ke Jianne was firing as if he could see, and in an instant he had fired uh, dozens of projectiles, so many that Chiu Chiu Chi was now forced to fend off the projectiles with no opportunity to fight back whatsoever. Suddenly a thought came to Ke Jianne. He's hearing Six Brother as well, so he's prepared every time. No wonder I can't hit him. Chan Jinfa's voice was getting softer and softer, with moans sandwiched in between, obviously in great pain. Ku Jianu did not hear Jiang Asheng make a single noise at all, and nobody was quite sure whether or not he's alive. Chan Jinfa struggled to get out. Hit, hit, Tang Ren! But this time, Ku Jianu did not follow his advice. Instead, he threw up both arms and fired four projectiles one each at the Jie and Sun positions right out of Tong Ren, and the other two heading for the Feng and Lie position left of Tong Ren. Not expecting Ku Jianu to suddenly use trickery, Chiu Chu Chi took a big step left and dodged the Tong Ren position, as two people suddenly screamed in pain. Chiu Chu Chi's right shoulder was hit, but the projectile aimed towards the Sun position hit Han Xiao Ying's back, Surprised and pleased, Ke Jianu shouted, Little sister, come here. Knowing that her big brother coated his projectiles with a virulent poison, uh -oh, Han Xiaoying immediately scrambled to his side. Ke Jianu took out a small yellow-colored pill from his bag, stuffed it in her mouth, and instructed, Go to the yard outside and sleep. Do not move. I'll come and attend to you later. Han Xiaoying immediately got up and ran towards the yard, but Ke Jianu shouted, Don't run! Don't run! Walk slowly! Han Xiaoying immediately understood and cursed at herself for being so stupid, because her blood will circulate faster when she ran, and if the poison was carried into the heart, there would be no way she could be saved. She stopped and slowly walked out. After being hit, Chiu Chiu Chi just ignored it because it was not very painful and just kept on fighting against the rest of the group. However, in the middle of the fight, he suddenly heard Ke Jianu shout, Don't run! several times. A chill went through his heart as he suddenly noticed that his arm around the wound felt very numb. He realized that the projectile had poison on it. Not daring to hesitate, he collected his strength and aimed a punch at Nan Chi Ren's face as hard as he could. Noticing that the punch noticing the punch coming his way, Nan Chi Ren bent his knees, held his iron carrying stick, his iron carrying stick across his chest, and pulled a move called Iron Chain across the river to block the punch. Jiu Chu Chi did not pull the punch at all. On the contrary, he took he actually took a deep breath and put even more force into the punch, hitting the stick squarely in the middle. Nan Chi Ren's body shook violently, and he had to, to drop his stick as the part of his hand between his thumb and index finger, the pearly cue, split open, and blood began rushing out. As it turned out, Chiu Chiu Ji wasn't keeping anything in reserve in an attempt to bring the fight to a speedy end so he could save his own life. He pretty much put everything he had into this punch, causing massive internal injuries to Nan Chi Ren. Feeling weak on his feet, numbness in his mouth, as well as seeing stars, Nan Chi Ren suddenly fell to the floor, throwing up blood. Although he had taken down another foe, the numbness in Chiu Chiu Ji's shoulder was getting worse and worse, causing him to start having trouble controlling that huge vat in his hand. So, with a shout, he swept his left leg, making Han Bao Ju leave his feet to dodge the attack. Where do you think you're going? Chiu Chu Ji yelled as he pushed the vat off so that it came down on top of Han Bao Ju. 
Because he was in midair, Han Baoju could not do a thing other than do a half flip. By then, the vet had already covered his head. In an attempt to avoid any serious injuries, he immediately put his hands over his head and curled up into a ball. Bang! The vat hit the floor and conveniently, neatly covered up Han Bao Ju. As soon as he let go of the vat, Chu Chu Ji unsheathed his sword. With a little kick against the ground with his toes, he jumped up and cut the rope that held the huge bell to the ceiling. At the same time, he gave the bell a little push to aim it directly at the vet, making it come down right on top of the vet. Now Han Baoju was truly stuck. However, Chiu Chiu Ji had, already, had really expended a, a huge amount of energy with these last two moves, and as a result, all of his extremities were beginning to feel numb, and huge drops of perspiration were beginning to bead on his forehead. Ku Janu shouted, Drop your weapons and stop now. If you wait any longer, your life could be in danger. But Chiu Chiu Ji figured that since the monk was in league with both the Jin and the Song soldiers and hid women in his temple, then his friends, the freaks, could not be any better. He would rather die than to submit to these bastards. So he turned around and began to try and fight his way out. With only Ku Jianu and Zhu Chong still unharmed, and the condition of the others still unknown, how could either one of them let him get away? So Ku Jianu held up his iron staff and stood in front of the door, blocking his way out, desperately to get out any way he could. Desperate to get out any way he could, Chu Chu Ji stuck his sword out right at Ku Jianu's face. Kujanu's nickname, Flying Bat Soaring Through the Sky, came about for a reason, so he easily heard what was going on and parried the sword with his staff, almost knocking the sword out of Chiu Chiu Ji's hand. Shocked, Chiu Chiu Ji said to himself, How strong is this blind man's inner strength? Could it possibly be stronger than mine? He immediately followed with another thrust, which was parried again. But Chiu Chiu Ji had found out that it wasn't because Ku Janu's inner strength was stronger. It was because his right arm was wounded, and therefore he could not exert his full force through it. He switched the sword over to his left hand and began using a skill that he'd never used in combat before. Swordsmanship of Common Demise. Uh a suicide move. The sword flashed as one move after another came flying towards the vitals of Ke Janu's, Chu Tong and the monk Jiao Mu. He wasn't defending at all. Every single one of the moves was an attack. The name Swordsmanship of Common Demise was designed for a person to fight for his life against a much more powerful enemy. Every move was designed to attack the enemy in a vital spot, with incredible force, and without the slightest care for one's own life. Although this was a highly refined sword skills, it was actually very similar to those scraps between ruffians and the lowlifes of the streets. As it turned out, the Chan Jin sect has, as, has a nemesis that resided in the western regions. This man was much more powerful than any of the seven masters of Chan Jin, and he was as ruthless as he was powerful. At one time, only the disciples' master could subdue and control this man. But now that the master had passed away, there was a chance that this man could come back to the central plains at any time and destroy the entire Chen Jin sect. The seven masters of Chen Jin do have a big dipper formation that could contain this man. However, this formation only worked with all seven disciples present. There was the possibility that they might run into this man without everyone being present. This swordsmanship of common demise was meant to be used against this man, especially in single combat, in the hopes that the two combatants would both perish and thus preserve the sect. Poisoned and surrounded by three martial arts masters, Chu Chu Ji had no choice but to use this skill. 
After about a dozen exchanges or so, Ku Jianu's leg was hit. Monk Jiaomu shouted, Big Brother Ku, Brother Chu, why don't we just let him go on his way? But because of this little distraction, his right rib was hit, causing him to fall to the ground screaming. By now, Chu Chu Ji was having trouble keeping his balance as well. His eyes were bloodshot. Zhu Tong exchanged several more moves with him, all the while cursing at him nonstop. Ku Jianu, not being able to see, was completely baffled by the sound created by Chu Chu Ji's sword and was hit again, this time on his right leg, and he fell to the ground. Zhu Tong cursed. Dog of a Taoist, bastard Taoist, the poison in your veins has reached your heart by now. Why don't you try and make three more moves with me? Furious, Chu Chu Chi simply came charging at him, but Chu Tong's lightness martial arts were very good, and he flew around the hole, knowing that he could not keep up any longer. Keep this up any longer. Chu Chu Chi stopped and sighed. Suddenly, everything turned dark in front of him. He tried to shake his mind clear and was just about to look for a way out when suddenly something smacked his back. It was a shoe that Zhu Tong had taken off. Even though the shoe was soft, it still carried quite a bit of force with it because of Zhu Tong's inner strength. Zhu Chu Ji teetered as he fought hard to maintain consciousness. Suddenly, something else hit the back of his head. This time, it was a wooden fish. <laughs> that Zhu Tong had found laying in the front of the Buddha statue. Yeah, the, Buddhist, the, the wooden fish is that thing that Buddhist monks tap while they chant. Fortunately, Chu Chu Ji's inner strength was very strong. A normal person would have undoubtedly died from that hit, but he did almost, bl but he did almost black out from it. Chu Chu Ji yelled at the top of his lungs, Forget it! Forget it! Chang Chun Ji, Chiu Chu Chi shall die today at the hands of these shameless bastards. Feeling his knees suddenly give way, he collapsed onto the floor. Fearing that he might jump back up again, Zhu Tong reached down to hit the pressure point in the middle of Chiu Chu Ji's chest when he suddenly saw Chiu Chu Ji's left hand move. Knowing that he was in trouble, Chu Tong immediately tried to bring his right arm back in front of his chest to block the blow, but a huge force came up from below his belly and shot him away. He was spitting out blood even before he landed. Even though he could not move, Chu Chu Ji had put all the strength left in him into this strike. There was no way in the world that Chu Tong could take such a force. None of the other monks in the temple knew any martial arts. In fact, none of them even knew that their master knew martial arts. The sudden chaos in the main hall had sent them fleeing for their lives a long time ago. Only after things had quieted down for quite a while did a couple of the braver monks stick their heads out to see what had happened. What they saw was blood everywhere, bodies everywhere. This sent them screaming and scrambling to Duan Tian De. Duan Tian De had been hiding in the underground storage room the entire time and was ecstatic on hearing the news that both sides were completely destroyed in the fight. Making sure that Chu Chu Ji was among those fighting, he told the monks to go and check whether or not the Taoist had died. Only after the monks came back with the news that the Taoist was lying on the floor with his eyes shut did he finally feel safe and drag, dragged Li Ping to the main hall. My god, that was a long fight. He gave Chu Chu Ji a kick, causing Chu Chu Ji to let out an almost imperceptible moan. Duan Tian Du pulled out his saber and shouted, Do you have any idea how much suffering you have caused me, you Taoist bastard? Oh, well, now your foe is going to send you on your way to the Western Paradise. Even though he was greatly injured, Monk Jiaomu summoned all his strength and shouted, Don't! Don't harm him! Duan Tiandu asked, Why not? Monk Jiaomu, still recovering from the shout, 
got out between breaths. He's a good man, just a little Im impatient, so there was some misunderstand. Duan Tiandu replied, A good man? Who cares? Let me kill him. The monk Jiangwu angrily rebuked, Are you going to listen to me or not? Put, put down your saber. Duan Tiandu laughed heartily at that remark and shouted back, Put down my saber? Then what? Become enlightened on the spot? He lifted his saber and began to swing it down at Chu Chu Ji's. Furious, the monk Jiaomu summoned up all his strength again and tossed the piece of burnt wood in his hand at Duan Tiandu as hard as he could. Duan Tiandu tried to dodge out of the way, but his martial arts were just not good enough, and it caught him on the side of his mouth and knocked out three of his teeth. In pain and humiliation, Duan Tiandu, ignoring the fact that he owed his life to the monk Jiaomu, lifted his saber and tried to chop off the monk's head. Man, this guy is not a good guy. However, a small monk who was right beside him grabbed his right arm and held on for his life, while another one grabbed his collar. In fury, Duan Tiandu swung his saber back and brought it down upon those two monks. Even though Chu Chu Ji, Jiao Mu, and the freaks were all martial arts masters, every single one of them was gravely injured or kept from the battle and could not do a thing to stop him. Li Ping screamed. Bastard! Stop! Stop! She had been dragged all over the place by Duan Tiandu and had been patiently waiting for an opportunity to present itself to her to avenge her husband. Seeing the ground covered in blood and this man about to commit more murders, she could not hold back any longer. She charged up to him and began to fight him for all she's worth. The others had thought that she was just an underling of Duan Tiandu because of her uniform. Everyone was quite surprised when she suddenly attacked Duan Tiandu. Being blind, Ke Jianu's hearing was especially sensitive and knew that she was female as soon as he heard her. Leaping equals leaping? Hmm, oh. Intended? Maybe. He turned to Jiao Mu. Monk Jiao, Monk Jiao Mu, we are all going to die because of you. Did you really have a girl hidden in your temple? Oh no. Huge misunderstanding. After a moment of surprise, the monk Jiaomu understood what had happened. He thought that because of one slight oversight on his part, he had not only gotten himself hurt, he had taken his friends down with him as well. In anger and humiliation, he punched the ground with both hands to help him stand up and charged at Duan Tiandu with all his might. Seeing him coming with such ferociousness, Duan Tiandu immediately dodged out of the way in fear. Not being able to control his own body because of the injury, the monk Jiao Mu ran straight into one of the temple's columns head first and died on the spot. No. Oh. Somber bells for the monk. Oh no. Frightened out of his wits, Duan Tiandu grabbed Li Ping and ran off as fast as he could. Li Ping's shouts for help got further and further away. Woo! That was a long ass chapter, guys. All right. How did you guys like that? I just died. For no reason. Not cool. All right, this Duan Tiandu guy, he needs to die, guys. He needs to go. Someone get him. Uh, all right. Wow, that was a, that was a big old fight. The entire chapter was... 
pretty much that fight. Um. All right. Did you guys like that? Um. None of them died. Okay, except for the monk. I don't think they're all not dead yet. Okay. I don't think. Um. I don't think we need any more bells. He's a low life. <laughs> yeah. I think they're all hurt, but they haven't died yet. Mm. All right. Yeah. I don't want any of the heroes to die. Like the heroes of the South, the seven heroes of the South. Yeah. It would change the name, right? It would be like the six heroes of the South. And it would just sound weird. <clears throat> All right. Cheers. Even the drinking was a fight. <laughs> um, yeah, so we know that Li Ping is still alive. What about Yan Tiaxin? Hmm? Hmm? Or Yang Tiaxin? Where is he in all of this? Because <clears throat> he was supposed to protect Li Ping, so where did he go? We don't know. If one died, they can recruit a new one. Wow. You're so heartless, Lush. What am I drinking? Oh, I'm the same thing as last week. The sake, the plum sake. I gotta finish this. It's up to here now, okay? <clears throat> Who is actually a hero? These heroes don't seem heroic. Nah. It's just a misunderstanding, okay? I think they're pretty good, normally. It's just a it's just a huge misunderstanding that caused the death of this one innocent monk who didn't know. He was like, what did I do wrong? I didn't do anything. <sighs> All right, guys. Um, I hope you guys liked that. Tune in next time, okay, to see what happens after all this, this aftermath, after all this fighting over a huge misunderstanding. <clears throat> Tune in to see what happens. All right. Thanks for joining. I love you. I will see you next time. There must be a saying about this. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish that guy was back. I think that was funny. All right, guys, have a good one. I'll see you next week. Bye.